things working right. So you can hear me like. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the narrative. This is Malfunction. I'm here with an amazing guest, um, Glenn B. Fleming from the UK. It's nine o'clock there in the afternoon, um, in the evening on Sunday yesterday to me. <laughs> And it's 9 a.m. Monday morning. If that isn't confusing enough, I live in the future. He lives in the past. And hopefully wherever you are, you're seeing us now. So thank you, everyone, for um, jumping in here. And um, hopefully we have an awesome um, dialogue, as we like to say here in New Zealand, Korero. And hopefully, um, yeah, we learn a bit. And I learn a bit because, as you guys know, I approach every, all my podcasts with total ignorance. That way, I'm just like you watching and learning for the first time That's about right. the subject matter or what's going on. No, nothing, um, learn so everything. Glenn, yes. That's it. Give us a bit of a bio about yourself and then we'll carry on from um, there. Yeah, I'm, I'm a resident of, of, of England. I'm in the UK and I've been working in graphics and illustration and writing for the past 40 years. Uh, I currently... Uh, I'm an author and artist. I've written 10 or it might be 11 books. I'm not sure. They're currently available on Amazon. I write about things like, uh, I, I write novels about JFK assassination, science fiction novels, adult humor, children's books. I write and illustrate those. Uh, I write about my my uh, my travels around the world. And this one is currently there, Rapa Nui, Easter Island, which is near you or somewhat nearer you than me. I went down there a couple of years ago. Um, oh, nice. I, wrote, I wrote a book about my my dad was a paratrooper on D-Day. So I got his thoughts and, and, and looked at what happened. And I wrote this book and illustrated it um, mm. about a couple of years ago to mark the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And I also produce a, a magazine called Comics Unlimited, which is available on Amazon. So I do a lot. Of, I do a variety of things. I also do paint. I paint. I make films, which I've made this film about Jack Kirby. That's he's on Indiegogo right now, and it goes along with this uh, companion book that I've written uh, about my uh, meetings with him and how I got to him. And these are on Indiegogo now. Uh, so I do a variety of things. I, I like to draw different things and write about different things so i've got a, i've got a wide range of experiences in those in, in all areas of graphics and writing and all producing and things like that awesome let's pop back into there we go back again all right yeah. so that's i mean that's 40 years of um knowledge experience i mean I was looking at nonfiction, fiction writing, um, writing as well as being an artist and writing in various genres. Mm -hmm. Now, um, with like we were just talking off camera before, like um, sitting up, you you wanted to do animation, and here you are at what? What are you? Sixty, maybe? I'm forty nine this year, so you're about sixty, sixty five. I'm sixty seven. All right, two years out. So. Here you are at 67, learning Blender because yeah. you, you know you want to turn one of your um, cartoons into a um, a, um, a animation. Yeah, it's. I mean, this is what I find really strange in today's day and age is like you get to a certain age and you're like kind of like bring in the new writers and all that, especially in you know this, in the silly uh, 2020s of um, comic books. And there was an industry where they just get rid of the old career writers who have, you know, have decades at honing their craft. Suddenly, yeah, you guys aren't needed now. It's like like a TV <laughs> day, like um, in Fiji, they retire teachers out at fifty five. Right. Well, so yeah, you I, kind of think there's ten more years there. I I don't think. This is just my opinion. Uh, I don't think it's good for the soul to retire. You, you yeah. should always have something to do. Now, I'm retired from the industry, from my in graphics industry. But I, in the past two years since I retired, I published seven books. You know, I've suddenly got the time to do it. I draw cartoons. Um, I produce this film about Jack Kirby and I've never been, and especially with COVID, 
right? COVID has sent us back to our caves, hasn't it? Right? Yeah. We've all been pushed back in our caves. I've never been busier. I've never yeah. been busier because up until uh, probably 10 years ago, I went to work and I came home. I worked in graphics. I came home and that was it. I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd draw things, I'd paint, I'd write a bit. But since I retired and since COVID, nothing else I can do. And I'm not the kind of person who sits around and just drinks tea or coffee or whatever. I have to do something. Like I like to travel. I've been around the world. I'm writing yeah. about that now. And um, I say to people that people say, wow, you've done this and been there. And I say, yeah, but I only took my my opportunity. And I believe mm -hmm. that all opportunities are there. I mean, somebody might come and drop a bomb on your head and all that kind of thing that's going on in Ukraine and all that, but you've no control yeah. over that. But what you should do is set out your goals and you should yeah. say, I want to do this. And if you, you see yeah. people, because I've been to many places in the world, people think that I must be quite well off. Well, no, I'm the guy who doesn't go to the pub because I want to save the money for the air, airfare. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. what I did. And when I was 50, I um, I was single, I had enough money, and I had the ambition to go to Easter Island. I've always wanted to go to Easter Island. And, uh, you know, I went there, and I spent two weeks there, and I filmed six hours of film, which I'm going to put into some kind of documentary sometime when I get around to editing it. But I wrote this book, uh, which is on Amazon now, and it's all about my trip to Easter Island. And what I do, it's called a personal journey because it's my journey to the place. And it's my experiences that I wrote. I kept an extensive diary while I was there. And it's mixed in with the history of the place. So you get a flavor of what the place is like. But you also get yeah. a flavor of what I'm like. And that's what I do. And, and on, the, on the Jack Kirby film, it's, it's a personal journey again because it's not so much about him as about me and my yeah. trip to get to him. He speaks on it and it's very interesting. Um, but I, I like to put a, like a personal twist on it, which is why I wrote the book about my father's exploits in D-Day. Mm. Now, I wasn't there, obviously, and he didn't say much about it, like veterans and tend not to speak about such yeah. things. So I thought, well, you know, he told me a few things and I learned about the mission from the historical uh, documents and wrote the book around that uh, about him and mixed it up with i mean there are there are things in there that he probably didn't do but the stories yeah. he told me i can mix it in and get a general mix so i like to put a personal thing on it i like to put a spin on things for example about um when was it 2003 i published a book called the two faces of lee harvey oswald kennedy's mm -hmm. alleged killer well, let me tell you, I've researched a lot about that. I've been to Dallas and all that kind of thing. If if anybody didn't kill Kennedy, it was Oswald. But there are, there are five hundred book there are five hundred books about that. And I thought, well, I've read all the books of which bullet came from where and who was firing it and who didn't fire it and all that. So what I did, I put a spin on it, like I do with all my work, and I wrote it from Oswald's point of view. So there's a lot of information in that book that or could have been in that book that he wouldn't know about. So I've written it from his thinking. It's from his point of view. Right. Um, I, the, the first book I published was a few years ago was a book called uh, Ten Tens, which is a, a book about football, uh, the World Cup. And it was the 10 players who've worn the number 10 shirt. Because when I played football, I was number 10. So I wrote about that. Right. I don't, but it's not, um, it's, uh, I like to put a twist on it because there's so many books and comics and films about the same thing. So if I'm going to do something, sure. I, put a, I put a spin on it. And that's what I've done. That's what I do with my work, you know, and um, that's just the way, just the way I work, just the way I am. So how long were you like um, with, illust uh, with illustrations and stuff? How long were you do, um, like outside of your graphic design uh, work? When did you get started and actually, you know, coming up with your own ideas for your own artwork and stuff rather than, you know, well, you were working as a graphic designer, right? 
Yeah, I've I've always done it. I I, I wrote my first book when I was eight. Now it was only twenty pages in a school exercise book, but if you think about it, twenty pages for an eight-year-old is pretty good. And I'll tell you, yeah. are you familiar with Jerry Anderson's work? You know, Thunderbirds and things like that. Yeah, I was just watching um, UFOs. Right. Just I think well, I'm halfway you, through it. Yeah. Well, if you go further back and go to Stingray, which is a marionette uh, show. Yeah, I used to first, watch that when I was a kid. Yeah, my first book was about that. And I was only eight. Okay. And then I wrote comics. I started to write and draw comics when I was in my teens. And then yeah. I uh, pursued that line. And then I went to art college and got into graphics, which was either a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not quite sure even now because it, it, it moved me away from things I wanted to be. I told you before we started, when yeah. I was 17, I wanted to be an animator. Mm. And it's the only thing I haven't done. I've I've written, I've produced films, I've uh, illustrated, I've done visuals, uh, I've done layout and magazines and all sorts of stuff. But the only thing I haven't done is an, is uh, animation. So what I plan to do is learn this Blender software, and uh, yeah, then I can uh, hopefully turn my cartoon character, which I can show you here. It's called Hatch, right? Right turn him into a cartoon film. And this is a comic yeah. that's coming out soon. Um, and that's what I want to do. So it's, it's a funny thing because, you know, it's taken me 50 years to get back to what I wanted to do in the first place. If, well, I, can uh, learn I, it, mean, if I can learn how to it, use it, I might not be able to learn how to use it. Well, it's the, I mean, it's how life is, isn't it? You're sort of like, uh, you kind of think, okay, this is the way I want to go. And you get distracted by the things around you. Yeah. But slowly sl and slowly and slowly get back to what you want in the end. If you, you know, if you're not too well, lazy, I think it's, well, it's the whole yeah. idea of like um, wasting time. And uh, like you said early on, like I, you know, you save money, you don't go to the pub. And I'm actually at the moment I'm thinking it's like I could save money by not buying action figures or comics right now for the next two years. And I could save all that money to put into what I want to put into. But yeah. My, you know, my my what is that called? Uh, the now the now happiness is, you know, is well, more important well, to me right now than yeah, yeah, putting yeah. it away. I'm I'm not saying I didn't go to the pub. I'm just saying I didn't go to the sure. pub every night. So you you've got yeah. to live. You've got to live because you're only mm -hmm. here for however long you're here for. You don't know. Yeah. You don't generally you don't um you don't see your end. You know. No, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So why not just be happy and enjoy it? That's life? right. So it's, so it's not that I didn't go to the pub. It's not that I didn't go out or see it. I didn't live as a hermit for 40 years or whatever I was doing. But I didn't go yeah. out and get, I don't know how you what you call it, get bladdered every night like some people yeah, do. Yeah, sloshed. Yes, to get sloshed every night. I didn't, I'm not saying I didn't yeah. get sloshed occasionally. Of course I did, but not every night. I was always working because I used to stand in the pub with some imbeciles and they'd tell me about all these great things they'd done. And and, and I'm thinking, how did you do that? You were standing next to me last night. When did you do this? <laughs> and then I'd go, then they wouldn't see me for six months. And I'd go in and they'd say, where have you been? And I'd say, I've just been all over Canada. Yeah. You know, which, which, which they would only dream about. And I bet they're still in the pub tonight and wishing they'd gone to Canada. Well, I did that. You know, so that's 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 the. But I always think it's opportunities, and I always say to people, life is what happens to you. You've got no control yeah. over that, to, to the most part. But mm -hmm. you should look. You should you should identify your options and opportunities and take them, because I believe that I have missed more opportunities than I've taken. But I've mm -hmm. done a lot of things, and I'm proud of that. And yeah. I write books and okay people can't not everybody can write books about it but they can but they can still have their memories and experience you know i'm for i'm i'm fortunate enough i think that i can go to easter island and and, and take photographs and write about it and, and document it and you know all this kind of thing and i'm fortunate to do that i think and then earn some money you know publishing these books and but that's what I do. But that doesn't mean that somebody can't go to Easter Island and, and enjoy it and experience it and then 
talk about it to their people or not talk about it. Just sure. hold the experience. I mean, it, it is it is the whole um I guess I mean like on the one point, like I mean COVID has just shown us that we can use technology and stuff and not have to rely on you know on so many other things to get things yeah. done when we just put our pen to paper. But the, on the other side is you have like you have people who've just used that not to do anything at all because it's just yeah. too easy to not, not do anything at all. Uh, well, it's it's just it's the same sort of like thing when you got like, you know, it's easier to destroy than to build. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I think if you, if you've got a limited time, uh, you know, why not uh, spend it and things that you love doing or that gives uh, you happiness yeah. rather than yeah, things you that don't... can be destructive to your nature. I, I go by the philosophy, or my philosophy is, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Yeah. And life can be as crap as anything, as people can testify, anybody can testify to this, with their parents or their heritage or whatever. But that doesn't yeah. mean that that you, you know, I don't mean you, I mean the, the person yeah, is, yeah. Can, yeah. Isn't, isn't free or strive to be free. And go yeah. to those places and do those things. If you want, if your ambition is to go down the sh down the mall and sit and drink coffee all day, then do it because you will yeah. have achieved your ambition. My ambition is to go to every continent on the world, go to as many countries as I like, as I want, as, as yeah. there are. I think there's 185 countries. Mm. I want to go to them all. There's lots of places that I can't go, and because it wouldn't be advised. Yeah. But I would still, yeah, yeah. I would still, if I could afford it, I would fly to those places, get off the plane, touch the ground, and then get back mm -hmm. on the plane. Yeah, you know, I would do that. Just say that you were there. Yeah, take a picture. Yeah. Bottom of the bottom of the steps, touching the ground, yeah. and then get on the plane and get the hell out of there. I would do that if I had the cash, but I don't have that kind yeah. of money because I think money is for uh, money isn't bad. A pound, a no, pound I'm, note, a pound note, or a dollar bill never hurt anybody. It's the people who are using it that make it bad. That's it. I think people get confused um, between uh, the love of money and money. You know, yes. it's that whole. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's it's a biblical thing. Like, I mean, like yeah. you can use it to uh, further your goals, or you can take it and get sloshed every night and have nothing happen yeah. in your life. And yeah. um, we're talking about traveling. Last week I was traveling to uh, talking to my friend, uh, my two IC, and about maybe doing exchange to uh, exchange artist exchange with Korea, with oh, Japan, wow. Japan, and yeah. with China because oh. what that means for us is like being able to like like and um so there's three forms of comic book art as you know with um, Japanese, Chinese, and uh, Korean. Yeah. So. Uh, manga being Japan, uh, manhwa, uh, manhwa being Korean, and Korean, yeah. man, man, manhua, H-U-A, being Chinese. And so I'm like, I would love to be able to think about doing that, whereas like three years ago, the only thing I could think about is Machu Picchu. Now Machu Picchu doesn't even matter that much to me. Now it's focused onto these, you know, these uh, because right. they do, you know, illustrations, they do manga, they do anime and stuff. I mean, I was thinking, wouldn't it be just so awesome to be amongst these guys and for two weeks yeah. just seeing yeah. how they work yeah. and asking the questions with a the translator there because I don't speak any of those languages, but, you know, I hire a translator and next thing you know, you're learning why you do this, why you do that, you know. And that's one of the things that, like, I think a lot of people have lost about how... Uh, true diversity works where you actually have an exchange of culture of food and yeah. um, languages and, and you know not based on any push or anything just let's sit out you know show me what yeah. you know about this thing that i'm working on and yeah how and yeah you know, like my mom's like well how do i cook that show me how to cook this uh why do you use that and it's like that sort of thing for i mean like in our industry is amazing because i mean if you look at a lot of the artists in DC or Marvel, like the top five, they're not from America as much as they're from everywhere else. Yeah, and it's 
and I think this um, this whole pandemic has also allowed us to actually work with people outside of our you know our um, our close units or whatever uh, groups and be able to reach across the world and say hey would you be interested in working with this and so, and that and like I mean like I was you know with on that getting to working with Michael Mead with his um you know with his when you guys are considering doing a book with his um, yeah. observations on Jack Kirby. <laughs> Which now sort of brings me to Jack Kirby, and um, and a lot of people. I mean, like, I was pulling out my little book here that came with like these toys that my brother brother bought for me a couple, of, you know, like about a decade ago, and it's just been sitting on my shelf and stuff. So I mean, I was looking through the, what I, what Jack had created, and you you've got Hulk was created by Jack, yep. right? So you've like design work, and you've got like Captain America, yeah, you got. Four, Fantastic Four. Um, I think that Ditko was the one with Spider Man, but like anything of major lasting, um, you know, significance. Just the time has been yeah. has Jack's designs on it. Um, well, what, so what you... let's talk about Jack because I don't know really much about him apart from like, hey, here's a guy who did all this stuff, and then he went over. He got pissed off at Stan Lee. Because I'm sued about how, you know, Stan said I created this, I came up with a name, and so on, and therefore it's my origination. And then he went over to um, uh, DC, and then I think did he go out on his own after that, or what he went back? There? He went back to Marvel first, and then he then he broke out on his own about 19 late 70s. He went on his own with the Pacific Comics and Captain Victory things like that. But I think what you have to learn, <laughs> what people what people don't realize is when you read the golden age of comics, or well, it's called the Silver Age of Comics from the 60s, mm. Stan Lee's name is very big. Now, Stan Lee yeah. was, a, was, a, was a, a car salesman, right? He's, right. He's, he sold the product, and without him, there wouldn't be any product in terms of uh, popularity. But Jack Kirby yeah, was exactly. the creative hub. He created everything. And what you have to do, I think, in comics is yeah. look at Jack Kirby and work backwards. And he did have a hand in Spider-Man. He brought a, a yeah. character he designed in the 50s called The Fly, took it to Stan Lee. Stan Lee thought it was great. And, of course, Stan Lee thought of it. I was just going to tell you that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and claimed it. And then yeah. when Kirby, apparently the story is that when Kirby brought his pages in, Kirby draws very heroic uh, figures and uh, strong, yeah. tough figures like Thor, you know, and Captain America. <clears throat> and Stan Lee yeah. liked the concept, but he didn't like the drawing, so he gave it to Steve Ditko, who draws very... Uh, um, I don't mean this in the bad way. It's sort of weaker... He doesn't draw big, tough guys. He draws weaker, real people. And that's what it was about. Do you understand what yeah. I mean? Not, not so he aged him, him, aged him down. Yeah, I'm not decrying uh, Ditko's work because he's a wonderful artist and no, creator. No, no. But Kirby draws people yeah. made of granite and rock, doesn't he? Whereas Ditko, they're human, they're bendy, and and that was the thing. And but even but Kirby's Kirby's hands are all over Spider Man. Well, know, before, I mean, it's the Ditko difference between that, that, isn't it? Between yeah. Ditko and um and Kirby. So you got your Kirby, yeah. and you got your Ditko. Yeah. So it kind of because they're more realistic, as you said. Whereas um, I think Ditko is more like in the Greek, you know, um, bodybuilders that they're based yeah. their artwork yeah. on. Yeah, he draws perfect anatomy, whereas Kirby breaks the laws and puts 50 muscles in where one is and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But what, what Kirby did was, uh, if you look at the timeline, he created Captain America with Joe Simon in the 40s. Stan Lee was nowhere. Yeah. Kirby goes away to yeah. war comes back, Stan Lee's still nowhere. And then in 1961, when Kirby's got 20 years experience, he goes to Stan Lee. Yeah. And all of a sudden there's this burst of, of energy for five years. Um, and then Stan Lee claimed it all. And then when, when Kirby yeah. got pissed off with him, he left. And then Stan Lee didn't write anything after that. There's a clue. But yeah. Kirby, Kirby gave us new gods, Eternals, all this Black Panther, yeah. all this stuff. So there's a clue there. If you look at the timeline, there's a clue. But Stan yeah. Lee was a great editor and a great salesman, and he was also a great dialoguer. But Kirby yeah. would put those pages in with notes on the side. You've probably seen the original artwork. 
with the notes on the side telling effectively Stan what the story was about. And Stan Lee would put great dialogue on them, better than Kirby's dialogue, I yeah. think. A bit schmaltzy yeah. and a bit bit twee, but you know, it was great. But he didn't yeah. he didn't create them. He didn't create them, yeah. in my opinion. He didn't create them. Because it's obvious on the timeline. Well that's interesting because I mean like I mean and we've always known like Stanley is me in the sense like I'm the mouth, right? I'm the mouth for what we do for our, what yeah. we do. I'm the mouth. I was yeah. you know, I'll get out there, I'll be out there. And then I've my mate who's does you know does all the figures and stuff, does doesn't say much at all, but he does a lot of work, you know? Yeah. That sort of thing. Or I have all these guys behind me who design all this stuff, but I'm the <laughs> mouth selling the product because yeah. I want well, I want to make sure all that succeeds. Well you've got to remember but, that I mean, in the, it, in the mid sixties, when, when at the peak, when when Lee and Kirby were at the peak, or when Marvel Comics were at the peak, you've got to remember this: Jack Kirby was drawing five and six pages of comics a day. People like wow. Dick Cole were doing two at the maximum, right? So Kirby yeah. was writing a book a week. He'd, he'd draw the yeah. fi the Fantastic Four in a week, and then he'd draw That's Captain crazy. America, and then he'd draw Thor. You know, his output was incredible. And at, at the same yeah, time, he was doing all the covers. He was doing lots of layouts on people, other people's comics that they were following. So how can a guy like Stan Lee be telling the story when the guy is taking, drawing the story off Kirby layouts? Why did yeah. Stan Lee take the time to tell Jack Kirby to do layouts? Why didn't he tell the artist guy to do the... Do you see what yeah. I mean? So... I'm not here to bash Stanley. He did a great job. Oh, no, no. Just... I mean, he, you had the car salesman and you had the mechanic. Yeah. Or the yeah. manufacturer, I should say, of that car. You know, it's the a different thing. The there's car. a guy who puts on the paint and there's a guy who actually builds the damn thing. Yeah. So, I mean, but, I mean, we wouldn't have all these amazing characters like Thor, Captain America, Hulk, Fantastic Four, Black Panther, as you mentioned, and without um kirby and the other great thing about this is i was just thinking about that when i was looking at the list you got a you got a white jewish guy who went to second world war writing a story about a black african and a fictional place and yet yeah. we love it here years later yeah you know and it's and it's like it's a fictional world and it's you know and that he's able to create and make make real now and you know, I'm not sure if they actually put his name on it or not because I, I don't think I was paying attention to that. But, uh, you know, that we wouldn't have all these characters or this whole Marvel Universe without Kirby at all. Got, yeah. of the, with, with regard like said, to... You couldn't have Spider-Man without the fly. That's right. right? With, re with, with regard to the Black Panther, you've got to remember this, that Stan Lee didn't serve abroad he stayed in the United States. Mm -hmm. Kirk, Kirby was at the Battle of the Bulge. He was in Bastogne and all that, all that shit, right? He went through all that. Now, you've got to remember this, yeah. that when Kirby was in Battle of the Bulge, there were the American only had uh, what they call Negroes then, units. Uh, they yeah. would all, they would all those guys would be in one unit. You would never get a black guy in another unit. No. It would only be in a black unit, right? Now, forget yeah. the politics and reasons for that, but th this is the point. Hey. When when Jack Kirby was in the Battle of the Bulge, he would see these guys, these black guys, and he probably didn't have a problem, and most people don't have a problem. Some do, but most don't. We're all, we're all yeah. okay, basically. Most people. Well, we're talking about 1943 here, 45, yeah. right? So, That's I mean, right. Like, so, but Kirby yeah. came across these, this, these black guys, and they call themselves yeah. the Black Panthers... And then twenty years and later, this is, this is the this is the military group, yeah. Yeah, this is this is oh, this unit, is the, the unit. This is yeah, the unit, not not the political thing that came about in the sixties. Nothing to no, do no, with no, that. No. They call themselves yeah, the Black Panthers before. because they were black guys and all that. So so twenty yeah. years later, um, they suddenly the Black Panther suddenly appears in the FF, and Stan Lee said, "Oh." I've got this great idea, Black Panther. Oh, it just so happens that I met these guys twenty. You know, you, you know, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, just ridiculous. He's, he's he, using, he's using a creative inspiration because I think uh, that's a lot of um, something a lot of people, 
a lot of writers don't talk about their inspirations. I don't know why they don't. Um, like, you know, what inspired you or what got you to do that? Or why, how did you come up with a character? Because they're afraid that they might l lose their IP because they got inspired by another IP and stuff. And so they feel a bit more precious about telling young kids or yeah. young people who are getting into comics how inspiration comes i mean like i'm you know i could be sitting there what like the other day watching an anime and i have a one line in, the, in my head going all right i think this might work I, i'll just put on my you know my uh turn on my um text writer and start you know typing up some stuff and then yeah. go back to my anime and i think there's a, a you know i'm not sure if you if you feel the same way but i mean like when you people come to creating stuff there's so much inspiration from the past we take. Yeah. Because there's nothing new under the sun, as they say, because everything right. that you can think of has been created yep. in the comic book world, especially well, in our Kirby, industry. Jack Kirby said to me personally, he said to me that everything he did was a variation on a theme. There's only five mm -hmm. stories. There's a love story. There's a war story, blah, blah, blah. And if you look at any, I always think that any story is a love story. If you look at a story like, say, Saving Private Ryan, it's a love yeah. story. It's about, yeah. they don't love the guy, but the, it's the love of humanity. They want to get him away from the situation. Yeah, e Everything is a love yeah. story. Look at Star Wars or whatever you mention, it's a yeah. love story, you know? But yeah. people think that love is two people in bed and all this kind of thing, and it's not. You know, you can. No. You don't have to go to somebody. You don't have to go to bed with somebody to love them, do you? Well, I mean, if you take that element away, that care and that connectivity between uh, another person and human, uh, you know, it makes for a very boring story. Mm. It, 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 there is no connection. I'm just going to watch through it and just forget about it. I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm always searching as a writer for that connection between. Uh, the characters in the actual story that I'm writing and then I'm thinking about how is the people that are going to be reading this the reader going to find connection to those things so there has to be something in the emotional or something that's actually could could touch their heart the person who's reading because yeah. if I'm the I'm like I've been through like where I've watched you know anime and I'm like I'm I'm crying I've got tears down my eyes because of that moment between these two nights I was just watching this one just early. I mean, this weekend. It's like I'm up to my third episodes. It's built up over the three episodes. This moment, and I'm there, like going tears falling down. I'm going. I think I'm going to need a break from this for a bit because it was very emotional, you know. And it's like there was no sort of, like you said, no in you know bed inside the bed between the sheets moment at all he's just confessing mm -hmm. his love to it because in front of yeah. everybody because of a reason and i think um wait, do you do that with your stories like i mean i know you're like doing like a from a personal touch and stuff you've got the rough and newy story you've got the jack kirby how do you like write a, a, a personal journey story about jack kirby and try to connect with the uh, you know with the reader on that well, what I did was, as I said, I like to put a spin on things, and th th there are a couple of books about Jack Kirby. But this, this, what I've done here is new, is unique. The, there are no other book. I guarantee it. There's no other book like this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying people haven't got film of him or photographs of him, but I've never seen them. They've not put them forward for whatever their reason yeah. is. But I can't believe that people didn't go to his house and do the same as I did. Maybe they didn't do it for yeah. as long as I did. I was there for six hours the first time I went. And I, I, I was always amazed that he, I, I was going there for an hour. I didn't want to intrude on his, his life. But they just opened yeah. the door and their arms and I was there. You know, I was there for as long as six hours, seven hours. Let's, what I let's, do, step, back and, um, let's step back and talk about how you actually got made, made connect, contact with, with, them, uh, with the Kirby's right. to get the right. opportunity well, to be there. It, it's in detail it's all in the book but what happened basically was that i went on holiday well let me let me rewind i i stopped reading comics when i was 17 when i was going to college there were kirby had yeah. left and i thought nah forget all that and then about 10 years later in the mid 80s i said i picked one up and it was a it was captain victory and i thought oh kirby 
he's still alive type of thing because I knew he'd be older then. He'd be in his 60s or whatever he was, nearly 70, because I wondered if he was still alive. So I just remembered that in one of his comics in the 70s that I had, he gave his address as, as this place in Thousand Oaks in California. And I went on holiday one year to Barbados and met two Americans who were from California. And I just happened to mention was this place called Thousand Oaks near them. And it was an hour away. So what happened then was that, you know, you probably don't it yourself. You go on holiday and you meet people, you have a great time and you're going to be best friends forever. And then, you know, obviously uh, you, you never see them again and things like that. Anyway, so when I got back from Barbados, these Americans went home and went out. When I got back, there was a letter waiting for me. And um, Suzanne, who, who was the girl with getting married at that time in Barbados to Bob, um, she said to me, oh, by the way, Jack Kirby says hello. Here's his phone number. <laughs> right? Now, this is 1988, 1987, <clears throat> right? Yeah, there's now, no internet right here. <laughs> exactly. So overseas calls were very, very expensive, right? Yeah. International yeah. calls. And, ve and, and I used to come home from work and look at this letter. I still got it. And there's the phone yeah. number. And uh, I thought, I can't ring this phone number. This is an expensive joke, right? Yeah. This is an expensive joke. So my partner at the time got sick of me looking at this letter. She said, look, just ring it. And if it's not him, put the phone down. Anyway, yeah. I rang the phone number. And his wife answered it. I said, I, intru I introduced this, this lady answered it. And I introduced myself and I said, are you the wife of the comic book creator? And she said, yes, I'll put Jack on. And Jack Kirby was on the phone. Yeah. And I just couldn't, I had no, no sort of, no Did time you stop to panic. talking because there'd be me. Yeah. I'll, I'll be like, yeah. the, um, <laughs> well, I said, I said <laughs> to him, I said, I said to him, I talked to him, or you know, and he was talking, and I said, I'm coming out next year to to California. Can I come and see you? And he said, Yeah. So we we swapped addresses and all that, and I got a couple of letters and this kind of thing. And then when we went, um mm. we went into their house and the and Roz's wife had prepared lunch for us. And I was 33 and I didn't speak mm. for an hour. I'm sitting at yeah. the person who created the Fantastic Four and the Avengers and all these things. Yeah, he's he's he doesn't know me from Adam, and he is feeding me, and yeah. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't speak, yeah. I could not. I'm sitting. There's photographs of me with him. I can't. I'm just sitting there, and it was in testament to his personality and humor. He'd be talking, and then he turned to me and say, "Who are you again? Why are you here? Yeah. What do you want? You know, just taking pulling my leg, you know." And then after that, yeah. I sort of came back again and talked to him just normally. And, and he was just fantastic. Just a really, really nice bloke. And his wife was absolutely gorgeous. A beautiful woman, inside and out. Just absolutely, I can't speak highly, more highly of anything than, than Ros Kirby. She held it all together, you know. And yeah. she was, there were, there were two of the most fantastic people I've ever met. You know, and they invited me into their home and all that. And then they did it again three I went again three years later, you know, went back. And um and that's what's on the film. The film is about is the is the second visit when I went to see yeah. him. And um he's talking on there for about about an hour, 45 minutes, about an hour. Um, and he's just talking. I didn't go with any agenda. I wasn't, didn't go to ask him any questions about anything. I just let him talk. And he told me stories about when he was in the army, when he was a kid, yeah. and all this kind of thing. And it's such a unique personal experience because I've seen interviews with him where he's interviewed. So he's being Jack Kirby. But with me, yeah. he, he was Jack Kirby. Do you understand what yeah. I mean? He wasn't Jack Kirby, the artist, creator, just famous home, person. Just he was just yeah. at home and he, he was, he was, he yeah. couldn't have been more, it couldn't have been a better host. He was brilliant. Yeah. And and that's, that's how I got to see him. It was just a, you know, I, I made the opportunity by going on holiday to Barbados. <laughs> you know? yeah. So you, you don't know what's going to happen. Well, I mean, there is that um, thing where, you know, if your partner at that time hadn't pushed you to ring, 
you would have just left it as well. And I think I think I probably would have little... at some point. <laughs> yeah, but at what point? You know, and there's so yeah. there's like there's missed opportunities, and I think um, I mean at, at this point, I mean like you know, I I just started getting into comic books again, and well, you know, writing and stuff in 2018, and you know, I took the opportunity as soon as it came up. It was offered. I went bang. I'm, I I can't live in misery anymore because I was, I was dealing with a bit of misery in my life and I was like out of it for two years. Uh, um, you know, and I was like, once all these opportunities, I took every single thing I could think of in that 20 and six months of 2018. I was like, stand up yeah. comedy. Yep. Telling a story on stage. Yep. Uh, theater sports. Yep. I had to pass that up because of my back. Uh, what else? Radio got offered, got interviewed on the radio, then got told I had a good voice for it. Even because I'd done it a few years earlier, I was like, okay, I'll do that. Six months of radio. Uh, that got me talking. What am I going to talk about? Oh, I know what. What I used to do. Comic books, you know. Oh, what else? Yeah. I, you know what? Saturday nights. I, I love heavy metal. So on Saturday nights, we'll do a two-hour show of heavy metals. So my yeah. the week got filled up, yeah. right? And so for, for almost like six months, I was like going 100 miles an hour. And then I was like, pull back a bit. What can you... In, what are you can you know it was getting a bit miserable at certain things that i was doing because it's like body can't handle it and then going back going okay 2019 we're gonna do this we're gonna do a uh, convention we, we're gonna start doing comic books we're gonna start promoting other people's artwork you know like i mean it was more like we'll, we'll start doing stuff that's more big, adding more joy but also giving more and i found that by yeah. giving more i felt happy with myself yeah um uh, when we started doing plunge and doing other work throughout the year on that i was like this is volunteering work to put on this convention for community it's like i feel happy right and then like then i can go back and do my own creations and then i feel happy there and then we do our magazine and we go we we're doing it for other people you know interviews with everybody around the world their own artwork and stuff as well as local people and that cosplayers and all that. But it felt good promoting other people because yeah. it felt like there is, you're promoting others, you're doing your own thing, and you're also benefiting the community. So it's yeah. like this triune of, you know, the trinity of happiness because it, you're giving, getting, giving, getting. And I think that's the missing part of our, our social network and life is that we don't give as much because we think by giving, we are going to be losing out. Yeah. And if, but if you're if you're passing on knowledge and stuff, yet you feel good and happy, and then you have other people doing the same back to you. Yeah. Have you noticed I think, that? Like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that the thing with the mainstream uh, comic book thing, you know, the Marvel and DC, with the you know being allied with Disney and all this kind of thing, now it's just all about money and take, take, take. Yeah. And and I think that the indie movement now has never been stronger. And I think it's mm. time that the, that we all took took over the mainstream. We became the mainstream, but we've got to be careful because we don't want to end up like that. Do the same but, thing, yeah. But but then again, who doesn't want a billion dollars? <laughs> you know, so you've got it's, to be careful. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. I mean, like that's what like I mean with us, um, with Plunge. I was like, who do I base this on? And it was like image. You know, it's kind of like have that free flowing creativity going. And you own your own stuff, yeah. Right. So you're not like you're not fighting off each other's uh, table. You just have your own plate, you yeah. know, which is yeah. kind of different to them. It's like this is my big huge table. Everything is mine on this. You're just you're just coming to have a bit of a you know have a bit of a what we call it like your smorgasbord on this, and then you're gonna go away. But we still yeah. have our table. I, th and I think that that's I think only that... benefits them. I think it's like it's almost like a metaphor for the human race. There's enough room for us all. Mm. It's just that some people want your bit, you know. Yeah, and that's really well, what it comes down to when we have all these know? wars and shit. Is because yeah, nobody's yeah. happy with their own little, you know, piece yeah, of the just, pie. They want everybody just, else's as well. All you've got to, all, all people should remember is just leave me alone. <laughs> just that's leave it. me alone. Yeah, but people won't. Don't people tread on me. To, um, people want to interfere and pull you down if you're doing well and criticize if yeah. you're not doing well and all this kind of thing. So if people just relaxed a bit and just 
You see, my, yeah. one of my big philosophies as well is that when the world wakes up and matures and realizes yeah. that we that we don't all get on, then we will start to get on. Yeah. Instead of trying to tell That's, people you like, must uh, get on with these people. Diversity of um, thought. You know, we don't all yeah. think the same and we yeah. don't all believe the same. We don't yeah. have the same religions. We don't have the same upbringings. But those same things can actually make us be more unified because we're like yeah. sharing experience. But we, like to, we, all like, we all like to eat. We all like to breathe. So let's all eat the other guy's food and look at his yeah. artwork and, th and say, well, I really like that or I don't like that. But don't destroy yeah. it. Don't kill him. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's, that's, that's my philosophy. Yeah, I think it's a good, that's the joy of a life is that when you get older, you know, you yeah. slowly go, yeah. it's a, I can relax a bit now. You know, I don't have to get hyper about everything. But there is also that thing, it's like, I mean, when you look, uh, especially with the ind independence right now, it's the greatest time in, in any age than now to be an independent because of all the things that are on offer there. And, uh, you know, I, plus the other thing is we're actually helping to promote each other and so on. And we actually, because of the fact that we're outside of, you know, the big five or in the, outside of the industry as a whole, I think we don't have to, we don't have walls to cross over. Mm -hmm. I'm not part of DC and you're not part of Marvel, so we can still talk about whatever we want. Mm -hmm. There's no, mm. there's no uh, corporate wall dividing us. Whereas, like That's when right. you look at those guys, it's like, yeah, we're gonna do our own thing. We're not gonna, you know, help promote you or, you know, or so on. I think it's it is an amazing time because the um, technology, like you're talking about Blender and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, that's been around for 20 years. The last time I, I think there's a book I've got on the shelf there. You've got, you know, you got stuff like Wacom. Um, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, screen, ta um, you know, yeah, tablets and stuff like yeah. that, pads, and but, but your that, thoughts, you know, you've got like um, software that's more very intuitive, um, you know, that you can with, work on. With regards to very tiny speed. With regard to art, I'm mm. a traditionalist here. I, I'm old school, as they say. I don't like that term, but the old school because I draw. With a pe on board, with a pencil, yeah, right, yeah. and ink, coloured ink. Whereas people produce theirs on computers. But at the end of the day, I've got this yeah. that I can sell. This is the original artwork. Oh yeah, you know, and people. people that's exactly don't get what I was talking to my brother. Um, that's exactly what I was talking to my nephew this week. Uh, like I, you know, you're talking about you you growing up and drawing and um, writing a story at eight. My, you know, my little nephew. We've been inspired, trying to get him into all this stuff since he was three and a half. And he's doing his own, like, drew his own Monopoly board last week. He's 11 now. He's been writing trilogies since he was, like, about nine or something. Excuse me. But he's he. I said to him, I, I gave him a digital tablet, I mean, a, a tablet um, pad, um, you know, a digital pad as well as a Clipster Paint Studio software, right? And I said to him, even though you have that there, I want you to spend 50% of your time drawing 2D with a pen mm -hmm. and then take that 2D with a pen and then you can do whatever you want on the tablet. I scan it and put it on the, sorry, on the computer screen. Yeah. But always have that pen and paper because yeah. there's nothing as horrible as you are as an artist when someone walks up to you and goes, hey, can you draw this for me? And you're, you're supposed to be the artist, but you can't because you'll be just doing it. Like, I know a lot of digital, uh, you know, they still, you know, I do all my digital, digital injury. But, like, if you can draw right there a little sketch card for somebody of their favorite character, thank you, delivery guy. Uh, and, uh, with you know, with a pen and paper right there in front of, uh, you know, yeah. your, um, give me one sec. <laughs> we 
was a landlord. They kind of turned the water off to repair something. Yeah, so um, because there's nothing is more embarrassment if you're calling yourself an artist and not being able to draw something when some little kid asks you at a convention. Uh, because it's 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 this thing you you're you're connecting with the other you know the person in front of you over pen and paper in such a tactile way, and that's the same reason why we collect friggin' um, comic books because we enter yeah. the whole hold it in your hand see yeah. it there in front of you uh, or a book or a novel you know i mean as much as i, I read all my comics digitally i have cartons and freaking you know containers of, and shelves full of comics yeah. and they'll never go away because it's you know it's right there in your hand and i think Ooh. if we if we just go let's go 100 percent digital man we're gonna have a lot of like uh a lot of artists who jump jumped the line and then one day going to realize, like me, that because I hadn't kept drawing as good as I had been at 20 years ago, I would have been so much better. Now, if I hadn't kept, you know, if I had kept drawing, you could have that amazing experience where, you know, you can connect over a piece of, you know, and I of, of a sketch card of um, somebody's favorite character, let's say, oh, can you do me a halt? Okay. You know, because yeah. that's, that's something they can go away home with and could remember by. And um, one of the, I mean, I think as much as software and digital is amazing, I still think we should never let go of the pen and paper. Because no, I, I don't like think we ever will. Yeah, 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 that's right. It's like um, if you've got the, the most advanced software in the world and a Wacom pad yeah. and all this stuff and the electricity yeah. goes or the battery goes or it breaks, I can still yep. draw in the mud with my finger, right? That's what I think. Exactly. But also, yep. let me tell you. Let me tell you this story. When I was thirteen, this this was showing the entrepreneur side of my side of my of me. I got into trouble at school because everybody in my class and the school knew I could draw. I was thirteen. Yeah. So I would draw Spider Man's head on their wrist here, you know, on the on the on their hand. And uh, mm. our Thor or Hulk, and I would charge them what well, the money then was pounds, shillings, and pence. I would charge them one D, which was nothing, a lot, quite a bit then. And I'd draw, draw one of these cartoon characters on somebody's hand 10 times a day. So I get, yeah. you know, 10 pence a day. You know, not a, it was a lot then, but not so much now. But um, yeah, of course, they go home and wash their hands and they come back the next day and want another one. And, yeah. and the teach the teachers the teachers must have got wind of this because I was pulled to one side and told I couldn't do it anymore. And I remember mm. thinking, what harm am I doing? I'm giving them what they want, and they're giving me what I want. Yeah. What is wrong with that? Share, sharing of goods. Yeah. Yeah. But but I was I had I was told I had to stop. You know. Well, exchange so, of good, I should say. Yeah. The, I should, what I should have said was, how much do you want to the teacher? <laughs> We cut them in on it, and then maybe I could have continued. Yeah, yeah. I'll take four, and you can have the one. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's basically what happens, isn't it? It's like you know, mm. when uh, with business, it's basically we we'll take a percentage of your earnings. Yeah. Now we become a franchise. What's in it for yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. So teach a couple more other people to do it, and next thing you know, you got a whole franchise happening. Yeah. They all give you a uh, you know one day each, and they keep four. <laughs> And now you've got a friggin', you know, mass market. Yeah. Now, one of the, I one think, the... uh, I mean, a lot of people talk about, like, uh, so, you know, like, there's this thing about socialism that really is kind of strange, which is um, that oh, I lost my thought. I had this really great thought about something, and then I cut myself off. Um, oh, what? It's money. Okay. So you can't, you can't, you can be the most freaking intelligent artist, great, 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 you know, brilliant artist, and you know, sitting here in New Zealand. But if you don't have money, all right, you can't pay for your power bill. <laughs> you can't pay for your Wi-Fi. You can't pay for your uh, stationery or whatever, and you'll never be recognised. But if you do. 
you know, it, you've got, you can buy your pen and paper, pay your bills, pay your things, and you can talk across and interview somebody on the other side of the world, you know, because the, it allow you know, being left alone, you're allowed to make your own, you know, whatever, and create your own books, go yeah. somewhere else at your own expense, uh, you know, put together a, a interviews of someone would never ourselves would never meet because that time is gone. Mm -hmm. um, but yet you, we have something put together by you and a DVD, someone speaking their own language, you know, they're there on the screen being able to connect to us because of our love of comic books. What is it, like 40 years later, 50 years later or something now? Yeah. Well, the you thing know, is, you see, and like if you said, hadn't done that, if you yeah. if you hadn't done that and gone and out of your way put put your own money in and gone and actually done that, yeah. we won't get to experience those moments uh, from from the horse's mouth, as they say. Yeah, th this is one of the things about life. I think I mean I I have negative thoughts like most people do, you know, like all people do. But I always try and see the positive. And the thing with COVID, right? We've all been hit by COVID this past two years. I've only started going on podcasts since COVID. I've only met you, and I've only met Michael, mm. and I've only met all the people in America that I've talked to. I've been talking to them today because of COVID. Mm. Because I because when before COVID hit, I wasn't into that kind of thing, that YouTube kind of stream yard type of thing. Yeah. But because I had more time on my hands, which I didn't really have more time because you've only got the same time, you know, mm. but I went into it. And I found all these different things that I'm on. I'm on yours now and that kind of mm. thing. So you've got to take your opportunities, like I said, and you've got to find the opportunities because opportunities yeah. won't hit you on the head and say, hey, do this. They'll just go right past. They'll just sail past you, which is what I said to you. Yeah. I believe that I've missed more opportunities than I've taken. And I also believe that I've taken a lot. And I'm really, yeah. really grateful to the universe or whatever you want to call it, that I have, mm. it has given me the brain to acknowledge these things, you yeah. know? And it was just my thought about, I mean, I, I went to the other side of the world to find two people who could put me in touch with Jack Kirby. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that, but I, if I hadn't have said to them, oh, do you live near Thousand Oaks? I would never have made yeah. that connection. Yeah. So... I believe in fate. I don't believe that, you know, when you get mm. to the crossroads and you can either turn left or right and you're yep. going to turn left and then you, but you decide to turn right. I believe that you were always going to turn right. You yeah. Know? It's, it's written, so to speak, that what will be, will be type of thing. I think I was, yeah. when I was born, I was destined to meet Jack Kirby and I was also destined to meet you. You know, that's the way I see it. It's kind of um, it's kind of like um, when you have that moment of deja vu. You know, you realize you're on the right path. I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Like you've gone away, and suddenly you've got your brain. I, I think I remember doing that, and you sort of. I think your brain sort of aligns with things like that, or symbiosis, as I used to call it a while back. You know, yeah. you you kind of like you're on the right. Um, you're meeting your, you know, you're meeting your destiny, as they say, you know, yeah, because you're on it's, that path where you should be. It's the same when people say people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci were ahead of their time. He wasn't ahead of his time. His time was when he was alive. Yeah. You know, nobody's ahead of their time. And it's like when people say, unfortunately, when people die and people say, well, they had the whole life in front of them. Well, no, they didn't. They died. Yeah. They were going to die. Well, I mean, that, you know? talking about that, you, you've got like, uh, was it like, uh, gosh, Taylor Hawkins from um, the Foo Fighters just died this week, right? Mm -hmm. so, like, a couple of days ago. At 50, like they reckon here, like um, they put out something in the in the Chile paper, uh, I think it was not Chile, it was it Colombia, about having 10 different uh, chemicals yeah. in his body and barbiturates yeah. and all that. It's like, I um at first I knew I knew it was drugs. As soon as I heard an hour before thing, I was like, I was like, yep, it's drugs. Day later, yeah, it's drugs. And here's where I get angry, right? 
my brain goes goes like I'm pissed off now because you had a guy as talented as he was, he was miserable. None of his friggin' mates knew about it in the band. The closest friends in the band didn't know about it that he was on antidepressants. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't right. care. Uh, maybe they uh, thought he should be left alone, which is maybe the thought that run in my head. Maybe they're you know? on them as well. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe they're on them as well. And so that why should they bother? And it's that whole rock rock and roll right, right? And it's like, um, you know, you, you should live hard, die die fast, and leave a good cops. Kind of the mentality they've had for decades. Mm-hmm. But they all know that they all know this that if we do drugs, if we mix and match, if we do all the silly stuff, we will die at any given time. You had Chris Cornell die a few years back, one of my own my own favorite um, artists of you know musicians singers, and. And then you had Chester, Chester died before that from um, Lincoln Park. So Chris Cornell from Soundgarden. And these are these are bands that I love. And I'm thinking like, how how do not people around these people know that they're totally miserable? Because we we're talking about happiness earlier, you know, because you're giving of yourself and you're getting, you know, you're going on stage, you're giving of yourself. The audience is giving back to you. So what is happening in and that private life that doesn't match up with the joy that they obviously is trying yeah. to show on there. Yeah. Because I saw, I saw like six days earlier, he did somebody to love from the, from Queen, right? Yeah. And he was bursting with joy and happiness and smiling on the stage because there's a guy who doesn't sing. He only sings Queen song. They have this as part of the concert uh, because Dave Grohl's there, a Foo Fighters singer. So they jump on stage. You know, they give this amazing, about almost eight minute performance of somebody to love, right? From one of the best bands in the world, uh, you know, uh, Queen. So, and yet they go home, they're in their uh, hotel, and he's got 10 different chemicals in his body. Yeah. And you kind of think, well, you've now basically cost your band, you've cost your life, you've cost your family's. Um, you know, unhappiness. Uh, you caused your friends unhappiness, but you yourself should have been happy, and you showed yourself to be happy to the world, but you weren't. So you lived a lie, basically. You it's know, like, of misery. Yeah, it's like um, Robin Williams. I mean, think of all the millions of people that he made laugh, and the only person who wasn't laughing was him. Yeah. You know, he was. Yeah. Really, Pagliacci wasn't he? You know, the clown who doesn't laugh. And it's just exactly such, 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 yeah. so tragic, you know. And he took his own life, and and it's just it's just it's just awful, awful. And, and it's really and sad, you know. Thing, yeah, it's it's. I think it's. Um, I mean, I've, I've been in the situation many times, so I speak from that sort of um, background on that. It's like because I think uh, I've had great people in my life who've just come across and said, "Get your shit together," you know. Whereas, like, uh, because it was just final, final. It was like, get it together. And I don't, and here's the sadness about this. A few years back, he was in a coma from drug abuse. Right? So if he was in a coma from drug abuse a few years back, and, and Dave Rowe loved it so much that he wrote a freaking personal song about him being in a coma and dying, that if they love, you know, the idea here is like, okay, so you love this guy so much, and you knew he was a, at risk person. He had mm-hmm. already been in a coma from drug addiction. And you're not, and I'm, you know, talking about artists here who are not going to be around other artists, their own friends. They've known each other for 25 freaking years. And in New Zealand, we call, um, we say, pull your head in, mate, mm-hmm. which is like, get yourself together, sort out yeah. what is it, what's happening in your life. Get your, pull your head in, you know, pull your head in. And, um, and, you know, take a step back and have a look at what's going on and figure it out. And I don't, and you kind of see like, well, where was there, you know, they know this guy's friggin' at risk. Why aren't, you know, but, so but don't, let's go on a war two instead. But don't blame them. The choice oh, was no. his. The choice was his. Oh, you know, always. And, 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 and you don't know that they didn't try their hardest to pull him back. Um, yeah. You know, but I do know what you mean. I do understand what you're saying mm-hmm. because it, it is tragic. I mean, look at people like Jimi Hendrix, you know, and Janis Joplin. I mean... If anybody yeah. had, if anybody had to, I mean, Janis Joplin apparently started taking drugs when she was ten, 
yeah. I think she lost her virginity at nine, you know, yeah. which is which is abuse, obviously. But she died at 27. Yeah, and then, and then so, but and it then was like... I guess cope with it. She's doing drugs at 10. Yeah, yeah. And it sort of... But she died at 27. And it's, it's as if yeah. she had to cram it all in quickly because she was going to die so young. Yeah. You know? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But that's just the, the way I look at it. Um, but, you know, she was a fantastic singer, a fantastic artist. And and to think that she died, yeah. and Jimi, then Jimi Hendrix died, I think, uh, either the month before or the month after, maybe the month before. Uh, yeah. And uh, apparently yeah, Jimmy, um, the September. Doors. Yeah. Oh, uh, Jim Morrison. That's Jim Morrison yeah. to the Jim, Jim Morrison. They all died. Uh, the Brian, is this. it Brian Young? Uh, no. John Bonham? Was, John Bonham died in 1980. Uh, Brian yeah. Jones of the Stones died in 1969. All those people. And ACDC? Yeah, that was later though. But, the, the, but all those people yeah, who are so millionaires. Like, million, they're all millionaires. Yeah, you've got all these people from drugs. You know, yeah. from drugs, and now we're gonna like, uh, like we're gonna lift up these guys who've died from drugs. As you know, I mean, we have their art, which they leave behind, which is you know what what we're talking about, like because you know, like you've got um, you know, you've got Kirby here living his art, art behind. I mean, Kirby could have been the rock and roll of you know of comic yeah. books if you wanted, you know, think, but he, so. he, you know, his entire life just giving to us, giving to us. Yeah. And uh, you know we we love him for it because otherwise we wouldn't have these you know we wouldn't have these little things here uh, you know right. to as our um you know as as our modern mythos as they say to be in love with to enjoy to appreciate to watch on the visual screen uh you know read in a comic book read as a as a no novelization and stuff without yeah. him dedicating to his own art and not. I, in a way, you know, you know, not finishing the run, whereas he did. Yeah. He, you know, yeah, he, he he was he was the the single, he was the he was the Beatles of cartooning, Jack Kirby. Yeah, he was the best. He was the best, and he was the. Um, I mean, it depends. You can look at it different ways, I suppose. Like, if you think if there's no blues, there's no Elvis. If there's no Elvis, there's no Beatles. Yeah. And if there's no Beatles, there's no everything else. So there's always something yeah. before, which is what we're saying earlier about variations on a theme. There's only five ideas in the universe. Yeah. It's just how you deal with it and where you take it. But mm. all great things come from something before. Everything comes from before, which is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm this age now and I can realise what an arse I was when I was 18 because I thought I knew everything. Exactly. And I thought, my yeah. father knew, I thought my father knew nothing. Well, my dad, let me tell you again, my dad jumped out of a plane when he was 19 years old into France, yeah. occupied France. That's how smart yeah. he was, right? And I'm, I, I'm yeah. 18, the same age, thinking he doesn't know anything. And he's looking yeah. at me shaking his head, knowing that in time, given time, I will realise, and I do now. Yes. I'm, I'm, I've, I've lived uh, 11 years longer than my dad did. My dad died when he was 56. So I'm the older yeah. man now. He has no experience of my age, but I have experience mm -hmm. of his. And I still didn't yeah. jump out of a plane age 19 with a gun on my back and a helmet. You know? Yeah. That's That's how... Uh, unworldly he was you know and I'm being sarcastic you know what do I know he jumped yeah. out of a plane into a war you know he didn't I mean yeah. he nearly when he when he landed on his parachute he, he landed in flooded field he nearly drowned so not mm -hmm. only did he jump into a war he almost drowned and he was wet through for a day to add to yeah. everything else and there's me thinking I know all the answers when I'm 18 yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know I can't the answers do, I, now. It took me until about I was in my um, late twenties to realize that mm -hmm. that I don't know Jack. You yeah. know that line from um, that line from uh, Game of Thrones. You know nothing, Jon Snow. You know, you know nothing. Yeah. And it's like there is, you know, there's a part of our lives that we think we know so much about which we don't know because we haven't experienced it through you know through our parents because um i mean like you know you're talking about your dad my 
my my stepfather's who's English, his uh, his dad uh, was in the Second World War as a minesweeper. Uh, he had he had he had to go to Russia to get his uh, frostbite taken care of. So he was ho hospitalized in Russia, and then uh, when he got back home, he pa passed away due to a car accident. So he was on his way home from the pub and got run over. You know, he's, he's gone, he's done all this, been on the battleships uh, in the English ch Channel, uh, sweeping these mines so the U boats can get through without getting blown up. And because he had spent, uh, you know, a couple of weeks in Russia getting his um, toes taken care of, um, he wasn't allowed to be recognized as a return serviceman for decades and then they finally gave him a medal for years you know about a decade back or something yeah and um and it's take you know it's like they're not our friends anymore so we can't um can't give our our heroes their medals <laughs> yay yeah that's why i laugh at this whole um, the concept of one one day an enemy next day a friend because over time people become friends yeah. or become enemies yeah. At the end, yeah, and that's why we need to like have this whole, you know, diversity of thought and ideas and sharing, you know, the past with the present because I think without that, we don't go forward. We just keep going back with repeating the same old freaking well, mistakes. You see, the thing is, is that you know this BLM movement now. I know, as as a mm -hmm. white man, I'm a white man, right? Or what is called a white man. No, um, we, we don't yeah. see that. No. Yeah, yeah, but listen, this BLM thing yeah. and this black thing, what they, what they don't seem to remember or, or realise is that it wasn't me, me, mm. who enslaved your grandfather and it yeah. wasn't you who were enslaved. Yeah. Right? But they want to tear me down. They want to... Yeah. remove everything of my culture and tear me down well yeah. it wasn't me and it wasn't you you yeah. know no i'm not saying well, you should ignore it or it's or it was good it wasn't good but it wasn't me yeah i didn't do it you know? i get that so i agree with that and here's what here's something that you you know as a brit and here's me as an indian so a couple of years ago um i can't remember the name of the guys i listen to so many people i forget who i'm yeah, the names are, but but an Indian historian, right? Who's he worked for the UN and stuff? Um, it was like 2017 or something, like after 200 years or something, or uh, uh, British in uh, India, right? So he got they got that there was this huge movement about reparations and stuff at that time, right? Between us, um, so one of the guys, historians he said, you know what? How about a dollar, dollar a day, a dollar a year for 200 years, and a story. Let's just forget it. You know, let's just do that. Let's just recognize yeah. it's done and let's move yeah. on. If yeah. you don't recognize it, but here's the thing. They want you to recognize it, but not move on. They want you yeah. to wallow in that in that mentality of you, 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 you. Because of you, I have this problem. Because of you, I'll never change. Because of you, you, you. All that the only difference between skin and um skin is money. Yeah. So if you get more money, skin don't matter anymore. Yeah. It, history well, doesn't matter. Nothing matters because now I have money to do whatever I want. If if we, and if, I we think go, if if we go the BLM route, mm. I want to know when the Italians are going to, uh, you know, give my country money because they ruled us for four hundred years, the Romans. Yeah. So let's have a piece of that. Yeah. It's yeah. It, it's bollocks. You know. How far it back really do you is. go? And yeah, all this, how far yeah, back do you go? Yeah, and, and it, this diversity thing is uh, we've never been more diverse than we are today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's never going to end. Or at least yeah. it, for I a thousand years. It's excuses. It's really it's really about excuses and um and and it's that it goes back to the three things, right? You're not giving of yourself, you wanted to take. Uh, you're not willing to learn, right? Because from the past and the good things that happened, you just want to pick and choose, rather than like saying, "Yeah, there was this and there was that. What can we learn and move forward?" 
you know, it's it's just like just let's just wallow in our misery and take yeah. everybody down with us. Yeah. And I think that doesn't uh, as creative people that doesn't work because yeah. you, if you do that um, as a creative person, all you're doing is regurgitating the same ideas. You're never yeah. learning, to, looking at going forward. You, you yeah. know, you're going to have you're not changing anything or bring any value to it. It's it's a, what you know. One of my artist friends asked this week. You know, why is it so easy to tear down? I mean, why is it so? You know, why is it? Why? Sorry, no. Here's something about. Um, how come we don't have more new stuff? You know, and I said well, it's because it's easy to tear down, tear yeah. things, destroy. Yeah. Because well, that's the that's the thing I have about the characters now, where they change the race and the color and the religion. Yeah. Of, 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 I hate of that. The, what? Why? Why does that make? You feel not you, but why does that make them feel better? Because well, the, the human touch is now a black man. Yeah, it's actually racist. Uh, yeah. They don't see it, but I think it's actually racism at work. They're pretending it's not racism, but it is racism because yeah. they're saying the black characters can't be as good as the white characters unless you change the black white characters into black characters. Yeah. So why? It, I don't really get it. So a black character isn't as good as a white character unless a black character is based off a white character. Yeah. You know, or, or it takes over that rent. Well, there was a, know, the, the, like, it's, there's somebody, it there, was some, there was some actress recently over here saying that um, a straight person, actor, a straight mm -hmm. actor, let's say George Clooney. Yeah. Can't, can't play a gay person. But they're actors. So, so yeah. So does that mean that when we make another film about Adolf Hitler, we can't have somebody playing Hitler because it has to be Hitler playing him? Well, he's dead. Yeah, or a German. Or yeah, a German. make it make it appear that, German. Uh, but yeah. that's the other thing. I don't know whether you, you get this down there, but over here, it's slowly. Well, not slowly. It's there now that we that we were being taught that we didn't fight the Germans. We fought the Nazis. Well, that's yeah. not true. That's not true because only so only seven percent of people in Germany all of them were, were Nazis. Yeah. They had the Wehrmacht. Yeah, they're all, they're the, all the German Germans. Army. Yeah, they were Germans. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know. I, it's a rewriting history, and I think they they their ignorance is showing because if you if you want to change those silly little things, what is the reason for it? Is it because we want to say that? It wasn't the Japanese Empire that were teamed up with the Nazis, Germans to fight against, you know, against the Allies. But time changes. So, but I mean, I don't think rebranding something takes, a, you know, is doing anything any good. Well, wh you know, whatever they like, whatever they do, it happened. Whatever they yeah. do and say, even even if they rewrite the books and they destroy the old books and nobody ever knows about it, it still happened. Yeah. So what's yeah. the point? You can't, Why don't we you try can't, and learn from it rather than change something yeah. you can't change? It's impossible to change it. So learn from it and don't repeat it. That's you know, it. Let, let's but, all, but just, the thing let's there all is, just get on. Exactly. I think the idea there is that they don't want to feel guilt. Mm -hmm. And it's about not, like, not feeling guilty about certain things. So if you don't feel guilty, so it didn't happen. If it yeah. didn't happen, there's nothing to feel guilty about. But it did happen. And if you yeah. don't acknowledge it, it's the first thing I think in uh, um, in trauma, right? You have to acknowledge it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If you don't acknowledge it happened, you can't move forward and seek seek um, help. Uh, yeah. If you don't, if you're not willing to say that you're a smoker and you're addicted to smoking, you're not going to be able to be willing to give up because it's going to be harder and harder. Well, yeah. no, I'm not addicted to the stick that I need to have now. You know, every every <laughs> hour I've got to have a smoke. You know, I'm not addicted to alcohol. I and mean, I'm not addicted to eating. I'm not addicted to this because unless I have it, then I'm not addicted. You know, if I don't have these feelings to it, then it's not part of me. And I think, I mean, I've lost there, but I mean, I think, I, I hate the gender changing and I hate the race changing because it means that people creative like myself and others who actually are those races, right? They do it to make us feel like 
we, what we create isn't good enough. Yeah. You know, if we, unless that, if unless I base my character of a white character, then it's not good enough, right? It, it's 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 very sad because it means like you've got all these amazing artists out there that have to they have to be pigeonholed into certain things just so to be well, you know, get their work out there. Yeah. It's gatekeeping on a really weird sense because they're gatekeeping uh, people who are actually very smart at their job from actually working on them because they're not the right skin color. So if you notice, like in Marvel right now, you have to be Asian to, to write Asian stories. You have to be Asian to do Asian artwork. That's freaking racism yeah. because that means that nobody else can do that. And it's like, I can't get do that character, because, even if I have a great story for that character, because I'm not that freaking, you know, I'm not from the northern regions, you know, of the Orient, right? So, but it's 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 like if I want to do Spider Man, I can't because I'm not white and a teenager. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but they but they even <laughs> changing that now, aren't they? Because when I used to yeah. read Spider, when I used to read Spider Man, Peter Parker, the stories are about Peter Parker. Yeah, who was Spider Man? Yeah. But now, if you put the Spider Man costume on, you're Spider Man, and that's not yeah. the way it works. The stories were about Peter no. Parker, who happened to be Spider Man. But like I said, yeah. is and it, that's why they have the, so many books. Yeah, so is it, it the I mean, it's is confusion? It, so it's diluted. Yeah, is it the Falcon now? Is Captain America? No, there's three of them now. Oh well, there you go. Yeah, they're gonna have they're gonna have they're gonna have three Captain Americas. You know, and the, the so they've taken Falcon, who is the Falcon, who's the Falcon, who's the Falcon, and yeah. made him somebody else because yeah. he's not the Fal he's not great as a black superhero as Falcon. You have to give him the Captain America mantle to make him be somebody special, even though he's already special. Yeah. You know, it's it's like um, it's it, it's it is tokenism in the the worst form. And I mean, I I um, I like the idea that you can have anybody can be good or bad. You can have any villain. You can have anti anti hero. You can have any hero bad person. Doesn't matter what race because if, when I'm writing, the race comes second. Yeah. Because the first thing that comes is the character, and I'm going this character. Okay, so where should I put him in? <laughs> What family should I put on? What would work for this character? Because I'm, I'm talking. I'm, he's talking to me. The story, the character's talking to me. I'm talking to him, having a bit of dialogue. Who's his friends? He's talking to, and slowly it develops. But then I go, well, that story seems better for him because he might work better, or she might work better in that place, not in this story, because he doesn't talk like that person that should be in that story. So if I've got someone who starts, okay, he's going to start using, you know, um, to start throwing punches, he's not going to be in a friggin' slice of life, teen, teen, fan, you know, story. He's going to be in some action hero book, right? Because yeah. that's that's his way. But I'm not going to change, you know, say, well, now he's going to, I'm going to come up with a character who's black. Now he must be in this street. He must live like this. And then now I'm going to change my story to fit that color of that skin or whatever yeah. background because that's i don't think if you know if um if kirby thought of doing that with um you know with black panther i don't think we'd have a great blank black panther universe and the story and the character and same with captain um you know captain america when you look at him he's the skinny little kid like me right and i've always been skinny i've never been over 70 kgs of 65 cages, never in my entire life. I'm 49 now, never. Even when I was doing weight training and boxing and stuff, never been over. And then he goes in and he's like, he wants to be the hero, right? He wants to go to war. He wants to uh, serve his country. He, despite the fact he's skinny and hasn't got all that, uh, he he wants to be that hero. And he goes mm -hmm. and does the super soldier serum. Now he has the body to fit the you know, fit it, fit, fit, fit the heroism that um, he's coming with. And then the other thing there is you've got Jack Kirby, who has been to war, now writing Captain America and creating the character. Do, um, do you want to tell me a bit more about that? 
before you know because i don't I, apart from the movie i don't know much of, and some of the some of the little bits and pieces i've read i haven't been like a big outside of um x-men comics fan of the whole other universes around marvel so kirby created captain america with joe simon in 1941 before the united states were in the war but they knew war was coming that's the one they knew it was they knew it was coming and if you if you recall on the on the first cover of captain america he's punching hitler in the face now they knew they, they wanted the ultimate bad guy to be in it and that was hitler at the time they all knew that the yep. war was coming and then what, what happened was that jack was called up i think in 1943 and but by then he created uh, about a year or so's back uh, backlog you know back catalog so the publisher would always be publishing his work and then he went away to war joe simon stayed in the united states in the army with St not with stanley but stanley did the same jack is the jack was there fighting in europe and then when he came back uh, he captain america wasn't wasn't his anymore it was published by uh, timely comics and he didn't have the copyright so he created other things and then went back to timely in 1960 1960 i think and created uh, the fantastic four and all that kind of thing so he was always mm -hmm. jumping about from different um publishers but captain america was created before uh, they were actually at war and uh, like i said they, they needed a, a super villain and uh, that mm. was adolf hitler he was he's a real person and uh, they had him captain america going after him in the first issue so he was they were well aware of what was going on it's like 1941 Captain America Comics 1941 um, number one. Yeah. So that was like that was like two years before. Because it was 43, wasn't it? Like when when we um, when America got involved in the war. No, it was 1941 December. They got they were Pearl Harbor was in 1941. So but Captain America came out a year before that, a, a six months or a year before that. Um, mm. It was 1943 when Kirby was drafted. But he knew it was coming. But when he was, when in 1941, Kirby was 23, 24. He was only a young yeah. man. And he created this great thing with Joe Simon. Joe Simon was a couple of years older. But they all knew the war was coming and they knew that he, the United States would be involved at some point. Um, and they were right. So they, but they created Captain America as, a, as the superhero. Um, it was sort of a, a, a post to Superman because Superman has these fantastic powers. And apart from the fact that Captain America was created by his serum thing, he doesn't really have any superpowers, does he? He's just a super athlete, no. really. So they, they wanted yeah. to do the opposite to Superman, who was indestructible. Because if you think about it, there's no reason for Superman to be around, is there? Because nobody can beat him. Yeah. All right? Nobody can. Yeah. What's the point? But... Uh, they wanted to create a more a more realistic superhero, and that's what they did. And then, of course, yeah. like I say, they were drafted and went to war and all that kind of thing. But it's interesting to note that when when Jack came back from the army, left the army in 19, late 1945, Ross told me that he didn't mention the war, like the veterans never mentioned the war, and um, yeah. he didn't he didn't draw uh, a war comic until the mid 50s. But when he came back from America, uh, from uh, Europe he hooked up with joe simon and they created the romance comics which is the opposite, mm. obviously opposite to a war you know yeah teenagers in love and all that kind of thing but it was 10 years full yeah. 10 years before he he uh, ross said he had awful nightmares about it and all the things he'd seen and all that and then he, he started to put all those things in or a lot of those things into his comics so he has a good grasp on i mean he lived a life you know Anybody who's been through a war for a couple of years, they've lived, yeah. haven't they? You know, they get through it, and yeah. not not something I want to do. Yeah. No, and and I think like this is why I think uh, when people start belittling what's happened, you know, in these past two wars. I mean, like last week I picked up a book, uh, twenty four hours of D Day, a hardcover. It was just twenty four hours when they land, mm. the first twenty four yeah. hours, and I was like, it's because I want to. I mean, I I 
get these books because I want to learn history because I, I've read, yeah. I mean, I've learned, read um, Russian history, the gulags, uh, you know, uh, in Nazi Germany, um, South America, because it all kind of adds into backgrounds, background in my head when I'm thinking of stories to write. Yeah. Where do I add these little pieces of little past in there so people never forget those? You know, just a reminder of what happened. Like, um, you know, um, I was writing uh, in Kurdigal and a whole inspiration came from orphans in Ceausescu's friggin' Romania, you know, mm -hmm. and the whole idea of like all these barbarism that we have. And like you said, like these, um, you know, they want to make it, the, we fought the Nazis, but we didn't fight the Germans, you know, yeah. kind of thing. Because making people forget the past is the worst thing you can do because you never learn from it. You stop well, people from learning itself. from it. Yeah, it repeats, doesn't it, yeah. if you don't learn. But that's what we do, and that's why I think we've got a few few more years to go yet before we suddenly wake up to this kind of thing. Mm. But it's all about greed and money, isn't it, basically? You know, everything's about money. It is money. always down to greed and money. It's a love you of know. money. Yeah. 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 Money doesn't do anything. It's the love of money, yeah. And and that's if you that's use money as sad. resources. If you use money as resources, you can get so much done. But if you fall in love with it, you never I, get anything done. I wrote a book about the astronaut, the American astronauts who didn't go to the moon on the Apollo program because they died in plane crashes and things like that. Because I thought, like yeah. I said to you before, I like to put a spin on things. And there are so many books about the 12 men who walked on the moon. I wrote a book about yeah. the, the, the nine men who didn't walk on the moon because they died and whatever. But people say to me, yeah. it cost 25, this is $1961, it cost $25 yeah. billion dollars to put to put Neil Armstrong on the moon, right? Yeah. And people say to me, what a waste of money that was. But they never say at the same time, it cost $300 billion in Vietnam. So we get, you know, you could argue that it's a waste of time we went to the moon. You could argue, yeah, but, but it's, you can't argue that it's a waste of time killing a million people over 10 years, the same 10 years. The other thing of that is, like, you've achieved so much through the technology of things and speeded up technology due to yeah. all the things that you've learned through that. That's and, right. and, that and you're right. Like, I, I kind of, like, think of, um, like, the whole industrial, I think it's a military-industrial complex, they say. You know, mm -hmm. I think it was Eisenhower warned of it, where yeah. you put more money in destroying than in building. Yeah. You know, it's just, it always comes down to destroy or build. It's You have a choice in it, whether you want to build or you want to destroy. And, you know, I think um, if we if we just spend more money on building and supporting yeah. rather than destroying and pulling people apart or countries yeah. apart, we'd get so yeah. much done. We'd be a better, better, better people as a human race, I think. Um, but people, people don't care about that. And that's where okay. artists are very important, I think. Yes. You know, musicians and artists, because we, we cross the divide through the artwork we do, we cross it, and the stories we tell, the music we write, the songs we sing, because uh, we we're able to share a actual, you know, tactile thing, and. Um, and we do it because we love, you know, we have a passion for it. I mean, um, how many books have you written here so far? Um, uh, it's either the 10, last or, years that you've 10, 10, or, 10 or 11, I'm not sure. But they're all on Amazon. You can find, put my name in Amazon, you'll find them all. Different, uh, awesome. different genres, if you like. I don't like that word, but different genres. Um, but, yeah, it's um, it's been a very productive time for me these past couple of years. Um I could have done without COVID. I've had COVID, not as bad as some people, but you know, I didn't feel yeah. too good. Um, but I could have done without it. The world could have done without it. But now we're being deflected yeah. from it. It, it. It's yesterday now, COVID. Nobody, yeah. we don't. Nobody talks about it anymore. You know, but it, it's the same as everything. It always gets deflected, and you got to you got to look at what's going on. You know, it's just because our freedom of speech is is disappearing fast especially yeah. what we, we talked about before. You can't say anything because yeah. everybody gets upset, everybody gets offended. Well, so what? Yeah. So what? It's not going to break yeah. your bones and stop you breathing if I no. offend you, you know? Just grow up, yeah. you know? But it's... Um, well, 
Definitely my nun, my worse. nun, my Catholic nun used to tell me when I was at boarding school, sticks can sticks and stones can uh, break my bones, but words will do me no harm. Yeah, you know, that's right. And that's and I think she, like I mean she was a, I think her aim was like to say listen. You can let those words do something to you, or you, can, you or you don't. Yeah. You have a choice in that. Yeah. You don't have a choice in somebody smacking you with a bit of stick, but you That's do right. have a choice on how that those words yeah. do anything. You know, if, if somebody, you if somebody calls you a name, and I've been called names, you know, uh, okay, so what? Yeah. So what? You know? Yeah. So what? I'm not bleeding. <laughs> yeah. As long as you don't hit me, as long as you don't hit me with a piece of wood instead, yeah. I'm I'm okay. You know. Yeah. So, you, I mean, like your words will be forgotten soon. It won't matter. You yeah. know, I don't have any scars left. And um, yeah, I think I I love history. I do. I think um, you know, history. You know, like they say, the least we forget. As long as we remember, you know, and we learn from it. The moment we forget. We don't learn anything, and um, right. and said, and I think um, the the industry isn't learning much at the moment. They think they keep saying they're learning and they're learning, but they're not learning much and at all, um, because the sales are down, and the sales keep going down. I mean, I I spent all weekend reading a manga, mm -hmm. about forty chapters of it, I think it was, wow. and I picked, I read one chapter, and I just kept reading. Yeah. I can't do that with a comic book at the moment. I just go, oh, okay. You know, I've, I've just not kept read reading and reading because it's so interesting. I've not read a comic book mm. since Watchmen. When was that, 1987, yeah. 88? Yeah, about 80, 88, yeah. I think. Is that yeah. late 88? Yeah. Early 88, yeah. late 70, 87. Oh, yeah. oh, should I say, I've not read a new one. I do. I read the old ones. But yeah. um, I go into the shop now and I thumb through them and they're just all the same and the drawings are the same. There's no different styles. And the, and Captain America's Hispanic this week and nothing against Hispanics, but Captain America is yeah. Steve Rogers. He's a blue-eyed, blonde-haired American. He's not from yeah. Mexico or Nicaragua. He's, or India. You know, or Africa. Or, 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 or know, whatever. He yeah. is. He, yeah, yeah it's, it says back here. Steve Stephen Grant Rogers, six to two hundred forty pounds, first appeared in Captain America Comics number one, nineteen forty one, Superhuman Strength and Reflexes, Industrial Shield. So Stephen Grant Stephen Grant Rogers. Yeah. It's his name. I don't see anybody else's name on there. That's Captain America and because what people miss is that those Captain America and Superman and Batman were, were created by Jews. Yeah. Those guys were Jews. So, Ooh. talking about which, uh, Moon Knight. All right. So, Moon Knight is not Jewish anymore. He's, uh, he's actually Egyptian by the looks of it, according <laughs> to the new movie. So, well, there's, there's an the, for you. Yeah. So, the writer. The director of Moon Knight is Egyptian himself, so he went out of his way to hire lots of Egyptians for it because he's all about the diversity, right? He's all about diversity, but the actual race of Moon Knight isn't even the actual race of Moon Knight, right? Which is, he's a if, Jew. He's an American if he, Jew. If, if he's about diversity, he should have made Moon Knight Indian or Korean or Japanese, yeah. not not what yep. he is, you know. So, but that's what it comes down to because they got to see themselves in it, right? It's me going, I must see Spider Man as an Indian, which was done actually back, and which I have a comic book of because I thought it was hilarious <laughs> because it was so so weirdly done. It was done by Gotham India with Marvel back in two thousand or mid two thousands, and it was funny. It was it was the artwork was good though. I must say it was like the whole. What would have it was kind of like a what if yeah. it wasn't made to take over, it was a what if. What if an Indian boy in India was bitten by a radioactive spider? And the artwork's cool. And if you ever see it, it's, it's really well done. It's written by Indians doing Indian comic of Spider Man. And well, you, um, see, you see, to me, the title gives it away. What if my, my title yeah. would my my answer to that would be so what? 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. What if... Well, what they if do that they... so what as well. I think there was a so what comic. I think... If you if you want to do what you want to do, just create new characters. Yeah, exactly. If, if it, but the, it's yeah. not about new. They like the legacy of the old characters. They like the name. They like the money that it brings, which is the most important thing. Yeah. It's about the money, not about anything else. It's about the money it'll bring if Captain America is now black, or yeah. if he's Indian, or if he's if he's you know Chinese, or if he's a Korean. It's not because they think it's a great thing to do that. It's because they'll bring money. Yeah. And they think that people will like it if you do that. But they don't realize that we've liked friggin' Hulk since, since whenever, you know, uh, 60s, whatever, because he's the Hulk. He's not because he's white. It's because the Hulk is that Bruce Banner, right? Mm. Bruce Banner, the skinny, skinny scientist who tries the friggin' serum out on himself. And now he's the Hulk. And he's having to deal with this fucking, you know, ginormous, horrible monster in him, which itself is a is a mental, you know, it could yeah. be almost like mental health thing, right? In him, yeah. Because, you know, this destructive being inside him. But no, we we can't have that because now we can't have that that whole, you know, why does he? How does he deal with this monster in him? You know, and it becomes like, how does this Asian guy deal with the monster or not? You know, which is what's happened. And I well, think they don't, they don't see the hypocrisy in it. No. They don't. It's like they think they're doing us a favor. You know, I mean, like, um, by you know, it's me. Like, I if like I have to write a, a, a Indian character if I want to for Marvel or DC. I can't write a white character. Who's Romanian? Yeah. Who's got no, no lineage to me? Like she's Romanian. I don't know any Romanians, but you know, she's a redhead Romanian. But I wrote that character in two thousand seven, and now you know, and but the only way I can do it now, if I was to go and say, "Hey, I want a job," like, "Oh well, we don't have an Indian character, so maybe you could create one." Well, sure, okay, I'll come up with that. No, no, no. Why don't you take one of our old characters and do that? <laughs> right. Why don't you write? Why don't you write Thor as an Indian now, right? <laughs> or as a well, as a, I was going to say, as a woman, and they've done that, haven't they? Yeah, they already what's, have. What's the you point? know, and what's the point? Because it's it's not diversity of ideas anymore, and and as long as they they take that out of the equation, you just get tokenism and racism. Yeah. You know, it's it's. I mean, anybody should be able to do anything. And um, and that's the whole point. Any actor can act anything because it's called acting. Any writer should be able to write any characters because it's called writing. Yeah, yeah. it's it's imagination, you know, and artwork. And I think um, you know they they do us a disservice as readers, as fans, and people who have been buying those comics like you know it's forever for decades, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in it, you know. Um, or, or if they're a company, they've made billions of dollars out of all of us, and now yeah. they want to change what we love, and they tell us, "Well, you're just racist if you don't like what we do with what you already have loved forever." Well, I I want you somebody know? to make a, a film about Martin Luther King starring Matt Damon. Yeah, they will. Just give us give us another five 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 years. They will, and but then they will say that. Um, we're racist for not liking a white person at that point yeah. in the role. Yeah. Because there's, there's, no, there's no logic to them. No. Yeah, there's no. no logic to these people anymore. And so we create our own stuff. And hopefully as independent creators, you know, we get people to support our stuff. And, and you, you know, like this book you're putting out and with, with the movie, I mean, I'm, you know, like I said, I don't know much about, I've, I've, I've Known what I've known from what I've, you know, documentaries that I've watched and stuff, and I've learned so much more now, you know, um, especially just um, how much, uh, how much he did have in creating the characters that we love so much now. Well, if if you watch this film, you will see the reason it's unique is that you'll see Jack Kirby, the man. You can find the rest out online about his comics and all that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. 
and and with the book it's uh, the the book the the dvd is basically jack talking and me talking about going there and all that kind of thing but the book is how i got there you know and and all that kind of thing and it's it's full of photographs and everything it's 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 really nice even though i said myself it's really nice there's lots of pictures you know of me with him and uh i've even i've even included um my notes that i took at the time um i can find them quickly where they go you know just to give it some uh context i've included the notes that the writing comes from because what i do is when i go to places i always take extensive notes and then write it up later and um but this yeah this is this is i say it myself but this is unique this is a piece of history comics history there's no other book like this and there probably won't be because you know jack's been dead now since 1994 so and i've never seen anybody bring anything out like this and it's all my own work it's all my design photographs and everything and I would urge people to go to Indiegogo right now. There's four days left on the campaign. Yeah. It's already made its goal, uh, but obviously yeah. the more people I want to put it around. And I'm going to try and get into the comic shops and all this kind of thing. But um, yeah, if you want to see him talking, that's what you need to see. And he's just talking about his life. He doesn't go. He doesn't talk about comics a lot. He just talks about his life. When he was a kid growing yeah. up, when he was in the army, this kind of thing, and it gives you a really, really good insight into him, rather than his creations. Mm-hmm. And like I said, if you just want to find out about his creations, well, you can just Google his name, and you know you're there, aren't you? So, but you know, I would urge people to look and Jack Kirby fans and comics fans, uh, check it out. You know, I don't think awesome. you'll be disappointed. It, you know, you'll you'll know what he's like. And also in the book is the transcript of the film, so you can. You don't have to watch the film to listen to him. But if you do listen to his voice and imagine the thing, that's how the thing would speak. This broad New okay. York accent, you know. That's that because yeah. he Jack Kirby's the thing, is this this small, tough guy who took on the world, yeah. you know, and that's what the thing's all about. So yeah, check it out. And Indie, Indiegogo right now. Just put my name in, you'll find it. Cool. We'll put a link in later uh, under this. Uh so I said about an hour and a half, and now we're going into almost two hours. So right. we'll finish off here, and I'll okay. um, I'll let you do the last, you know, last words as we do with each one. So um, you've got a couple minutes to say whatever you want, um, you know, about what you do and about yourself. And okay, we'll okay. Well, you can, I'm a writer. I'm a writer and artist. I've written ten, uh, it might be eleven books. I'm not sure. Published those books. They're all on Amazon. If you put my name in. Uh, Glenn with two N's and B and one M in Fleming, you'll find these books and you'll find a lot of magazines that I produce as well. Um, as I showed you before, I currently produce Comics Unlimited, which is about comics, believe it or not. We've got interviews, that cover, we've covered articles on, on stuff, you know, all this kind of thing. Uh, that's Issue nine is about to be published. You can find that on Amazon. Uh, check out this if you like travel books. Uh, not so much a travel book, I shouldn't say that. Uh, my my travels to Easter Island, uh, and it's extensive uh, notes that I took there. I took over a thousand photographs. I took six hours of film, and it's the film isn't in here, but all the photographs are in of all these giant statues and everything. You know, uh, check it out. I also wrote this one about my dad uh, on D Day as a paratrooper. And I've also written science fiction books, novels, um, children's books, and you can find them all on Amazon. Um, but please, I would urge you to, to check this out on Indiegogo and maybe hopefully back it. And just this is a unique piece of comics history. And then and you also get the film with it. There's only one tier on it. You get the book and the film, and that's it. That's all you need. Uh, that's about it, really. That's about the lot. All right. So thank you for joining um, joining us, guys, um, wherever you are. As always, keep safe and uh, be well. Kakite um, ano until next time. I want to thank um, Glenn um, for, you know, for providing us an opportunity to talk to him about what he does. And uh, I think we sort of 
the weird thing is here here we are on the other side of the world thinking the same thing about our industry as yeah. independent creators uh with almost like i know 16 years difference between us and with 67 and we with 49 uh but we've all we've both been like lifetime uh, comic fans and yeah, um, it's all about you know, producing you, art it's producing art yeah. art is timeless music is timeless you know, yeah. and that's what we that's what we do. We produce art. It's the most, most awesome. important thing on the planet, apart from maybe breathing and sex. You know, because without sex, we don't make the next one. So, we, but we need art. Yeah, creativity. Yeah, I mean, without that, we wouldn't be building houses, coming up with car designs, roads, exactly. and all the infrastructure yeah. that we have. Exactly. And a lot of yeah. times, people forget the importance of art. That and the things that you know. So many things that we come up with, like even the simple thing is a pen. It's created, mm -hmm. by, created by an artist who actually scrubs some charcoal together yep. or pencils together. All right. So thank you, guys. We'll see you next time on the, um, on the narrative. And once again, thank you, Glenn, um, all the way from the UK. Cheers for thank joining you. me. And Thanks, we'll see Aru. you next time, guys. Yeah, thank you.